itself a lot. After those days, you go, shall I say, I went to Italy and I started my really great career, and the main career. Then you learn to really become a musician. After a singer, you have to put your instrument to the service of music, not only to the bel canto, to uh, the duty and uh, the line of music. Uh, then on, you really become, or you strive to become a musician. In other words, the main instrument of the orchestra. Yes. Which is probably, not probably, it is exactly the meaning of prima donna. Prima donna would be first woman. As you are a woman, you are the prima donna of the performance. And all this you were learning, really, at the time you first went to Italy? Yes, I learned that with uh, Maestro Serafin. I've always thought that was the one that was the lucky thing man. that happened yes, to you. Yes, that was one of the many lucky things, and maybe the, the really lucky things, because he taught me that there must be an expression, there must be a justification. He taught me exactly the depth of music, and this was the, the justification of music. That is where I really, really uh, drank all I could from this man. He was, after all, the first maestro you worked with in he Italy. He was the first, and I'm afraid... Uh, I'm afraid that he's the last of those kind of maestri. Very few Italian conductors had a more distinguished career than did Tullio Serafin, and perhaps none apart from Toscanini, more influence. His career spans the entire century, short of a year or two. His time at La Scala alone spread over 40 years, and at Covent Garden with some gaps over 53 years. He conducted at the Met in Chicago, in South America, and he was artistic director in Rome from 1934 to 43, perhaps his most distinguished and uncompromising period. Above all, Serafin was a singer's conductor. Uh, what I learned from Serafin was that you must serve music because music is so enormous and can envelop you into such a, uh, a state of, uh, of perpetual anxiety and torture but it is our first and main duty. He always found a reason for something. What he said impressed me was, when one wants to find a gesture, when you want to find how to act on stage, all you have to do is listen to the music. The composer has already sought, seen to that. If you take the trouble to really listen with your soul and with your ears, and I say soul and ears because the mind must work, but not too much also. Uh, you will find every gesture there. And it's so true, you know. In fact, acting production is a musical thing in opera. That's what it, it is. It's all the basis of the one reflex, usually. It is one enormous reflex with many, many reflexes put together. Which comes back to what we were saying before that by the time you're on stage dealing with music as a uh, no more an amateur musician, but a uh, professional, serious musician, you must have no, no more mi uh, surprises. You, in fact, have had, uh, in your early career in Italy, something approaching surprises, but not uh, on the stage, more in choice of repertory. Weren't you engaged to sing Wagner and find yourself singing Bellini? <laughs> I don't mean by mistake, but in the course of the season. <laughs> Well, it was nearly by mistake. I mean, it's by a miracle, shall we say. Yes, it's true. I was doing uh, Valkyria, which was uh, my second year in, uh, at the Fenice of Venice. And I remember there was a, uh, a great, uh, shall we say, uh, an influenza fever mm -hmm. or uh, epidemic. And they were without a uh, soprano for Puritani of Bellini. And uh, poor old Serafin was exhausted, desperate. He couldn't find this singer and that singer. We didn't know what to do in the evening, so uh, we were just, uh, you know, sight-reading the role and playing around with the, with the music. So his wife uh, heard me singing the aria, sight-reading the aria. And she came in. Uh, it was in his apartment, uh, Master Serafin's apartment. She says, uh, she said, will you do me a favor? When my husband comes in, in fact, she didn't call him my husband, she says, Tullio comes in. Uh, she said, will you please sing that for him? I said, will it please him and make him happier? Yes. In fact, I did when he came back. 
never said a word. The next day, 10 o'clock in the morning, was after my, already my first performance of Valkyria. I think the next day, or the evening, I think the same evening we had the, the second Valkyria. And uh, I was called on the telephone, uh, please put your robe and come down, or come up, whatever it was. Master Serafine. I said, Master, I'm not washed up, it'll take me about half an hour. I said, no, 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 come down the way you are. Of course, we wouldn't even say no to it. It was sort of a veneration for the Master mm. then. And uh, I went down, and he said, sing. I said, what? Sing what you to uh, sang to me yesterday. There was the director of the theater, Katozzo then, and uh, I said, uh, anyway, I was forced to sing the aria, and uh, sight read, of course, which was the second time, the third time I sight read it. I heard them talking, and he says uh, to me, well, look, Maria, you're going to do this role in a week. I said, I'm going to do what in a week? He says, you're going to sing Puritania in a week. I undertake that you study it. I said, I can't. I have three more Valkyrias. I can't do it. It's ridiculous that I sing Puritani. He says, I guarantee you that you can. So I thought to myself, well, if a man like Serafine, who is no child, knows his job, can guarantee me a thing like that, I will be no fool to say no. And I said, well, my, so my best I can do. More than my best, I cannot promise. If I manage to learn the part with my performances of Valkyrie and the time in Valkyrie, not Siglinde, Brunhilde. Brunhilde. I point out. <laughs> and he says, all right, I guarantee you that, and you guarantee me that you try. That's good enough for me. So I said, well, inside of myself, is that crazy enough to think that? And I, I was still young, and you know, being young, you have to uh, gamble. There is when my experience and my schooling days came handy. Yes. Because I was al al already prepared for all the tricks. You could but have shocks, the but not basic, surprises. No surprises, and no shocks even. Because, you see, uh, Wagner is much easier to sing, frankly. In a way, yes, of course. In every way. Mm. When I used to sing Isolde and I used to sing uh, Brunhilde, there was no comparison with the Bellini roles or even the Donizetti. Because they're much less exposed mm -hmm. and much less difficult. But the basis is the schooling of bel canto, to sing whatever you sing. When you get a new role, a new part yes. suggested to you, will you sing, will you consider singing such and such an opera by exactly. so-and-so, what happens to you then? Well then, the, uh, it's a very matter-of-fact, uh, you really have to put your feet on your ground and be very matter-of-fact in the beginning. Uh, you look at the role as we know how to read and write, we know how to read our music. We're supposed to. <laughs> so you read a role and in the beginning you're enthused, you're exalted and you say, well, I have a way of my own. Le this way I've learned from my teacher De Dalgo and also from uh, Serafine, which are the major uh, people in my life. They have taught me and life has taught me that the last act is the most important. Because no matter how much and how well you've sung on the very few, mm. one or two or three or four first acts, if the last act, act is not superior to all the rest, well, you might as well not sing it. We have sung frequently roles that do not have the best last act, but I essentially choose an opera where at the end, the last impression is the best. So you get the score and you go through First with all, particular attention there. You, you go read through, through the score and yes, see how it feels. You go through the score, so you have a brief look it and you say briefly well uh, to sum it up mm. in two minutes shall we say or what it takes yes i would like to do it now once you say yes then you take it act by act and you first of all say uh what is she does the the uh the characterization the 
how can I say, the person agree with the music. You put the music together with the personaggio and you try to make them agree. Frequently they do agree. Then you take the music and you learn it as you were in the, uh, in the conservatoire. In other words, exactly as it's written, nothing more and nothing less. Which uh, uh, is the phrase that I call straightjacketing. Absolutely and strictly in exactly temper and everything. strictly how the composer wrote it. Mm. The, the uh, conductor gives you his cuts, gives you his possibilities. Uh, if you have cadenzas, he gives you ideas about what his cadenzas would be. And his cadenzas, I mean, are never his if he's a, a conscientious conductor. He always builds his cadenzas according to the taste and the liking and the particular uh, makings of the uh, composer. Yes. Because Bellini is quite different mm. from Donizetti. Mm. Donizetti is quite different from Be De Rossini and so forth and so on. And the composers felt that if you're dealing with sentiments, with characters, with music, let us deal with less florid things, or rather let us use embellishments to the service of expressions. In fact, mm. in the later years of Verdi, even Bellini shall we say even Donizetti, if you care that much for the composers and not for your own private uh, uh, success, if you really care to look into the music, you, was always, you will always find a trill or an embellishment or a scale that justifies an expression of feeling of happiness or of, of uh, unhappiness, of uh, uneasiness, anxiety. There is always a reason for such things. Then you learn the role exactly as A, B, C, D. And when you've learned that, then you try to speak it to yourself, as you have the recitative. By recitative, what do we mean? Speaking. They are the introductions to the arias, uh, usually. Once upon a time, 150 years ago, the public just used to walk out eat, laugh, I don't know, used to stay eternally in the theatre and would come in for the big pieces. Thank heavens now they don't. So the composers are much more respected now than once upon a time. Yes. The recitative are frequently very attractive and very difficult to give a, uh, shall we say, a, a rhythm, because all music has a certain rhythm. By rhythm I don't mean the way it's written exactly, because once you learn how it's written and the exact value of each note and each phrase, then, and this I have learned from Seraphine in occasion of my Norma, when I auditioned, so he said, very well, you know the music perfectly well. Now you go home, my dear Miss Callas, and uh, speak it to yourself. Keep on speaking and let's see if with what proportions, with what rhythm you come back to me tomorrow. Because if you speak it to yourself, how would you do it in music? Forget that you're singing and these are the values. Respect the values, but try to be free for a minute. If you spoke these phrases, how would you speak them? According to Bellini's style and this and that. And on that, you uh, cultivated yourself, which is so true. The recitative must have a certain flowing rhythm. What That's you give at a certain point, yes. you take, you give back, you take here, you give back there. And the characterization of Italian music is always a flowing movement, no matter how slow things go, no matter how slow rhythm. So once you get that uh, in your mind, and it's not done in one day, it's not done in one week, and in fact I don't think it's ever finished, because a com uh, uh, an interpreter grows each year. Exactly. You've matured it. Your subconscious has matured it and has made it his own, so it helps you out. And it has uh, managed to, uh, to mature the role, and uh, in, in other words, then, having broke this down, broken this down completely, then you can take wings. By taking wings, I mean from down to earth, two and two makes four, because everything must, must, uh, be logical in opera, because you can't persuade the public of, uh, of a preposterous thing. Of course, what is the main thing that musicians should do is give it the most credibility possible, and to persuade the public.
of its reality. There we come And back. to take them over. As I say, opera is uh, something that has been dead quite a while ago. So if we really don't try our very best to give it much seriousness and much uh, persuasiveness and dignity, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not taken in with pleasure. When you're working on a new part, at what stage do you ask for collaboration? You obviously need a pianist fairly early on. Definitely, yes. Uh, a pianist, well yes. Time. A pianist that can be very, very, uh, shall we say, very particular in teaching you exact, uh, to remind you exactly the values of notes and not let one slip you. You learn the role, you uh, roughly le learn it, as I say, because this goes in stages. You cannot expect to learn it immediately. You have to uh, give it time to be learned, to be matured, and then leave it and then retake it. And then after that, it depends whether you have lots of time. If you have lots of time, it can take you uh, even months, but it can take me very little also. Depends. Then you need the uh, company. That usually happens after about two weeks' time. Or, yes. Then all uh, are called for a rehearsal, the first piano rehearsal. Then you start. I usually... That's with the, with the master, with, with the conductor. Uh, yes, but with the, your other colleagues also. Yes. I mm -hmm. used to, in my early years, I always did, in fact, I used to look at the posters and ask and uh, see when the, ma uh, the when the maestro, the conductor, had his readings with the orchestra. Uh, with the orchestra, because I'm short-sighted <coughs> and I cannot depend on cues given to me by the conductor himself or uh, the uh, prompter. Prompter. So also because uh, I live into the music, and I used to assist to his readings, which is most interesting. So therefore, I, I went when I was quite prepared. Then we're all terrified because it's, you know, to put so many people together is really quite terrifying. That's when all the things that have stuck together start to fall apart. Thanks. Well, uh, can do. Can and do, can do frequently. And in old operas like old, I say old operas of uh, mine, like La Norma or Traviata, always, nearly always, and I can say always, at certain points of the chorus, I know exactly where they're going to stop. I know exactly where they're going to repeat the same things for over and over again. One would say, all over the world. There are certain parts that stick, shall we say. Can't get rid of them. <laughs> so, uh, finally, uh, you build the whole thing together. Stage, orchestra, colleagues, orchestra, um, chorus. And in the meantime, you try on your costumes. You've already seen the designs. Uh, so uh, then eventually you reach, uh, with a lot of quarreling between the conductor and the stage director, no, this is my rehearsal, no, this is my <laughs> rehearsal. Well, all right, I can't stop all the time because we have to measure, you know, the space and the breathing and this uh, rhythm of the thing. We also have to measure because still, up to this point, we have not sung the opera and performed the opera straight through because you have to do that more than uh, three or four times yes. because you should measure your strength, uh, where you can rest, where you can uh, get away with uh, lots of things. You really have to uh, exactly know where you stand. When do you start actually singing with full voice? Because you don't do that all the way through, do you, in, in rehearsal? There is one thing that you must do, you really must, from the very first rehearsals, uh, orchestra rehearsals, absolutely must sing in full voice for your own sake for your colleagues sake and the main thing is to, uh, to uh, test your own possibilities yes. finally you, re you reach the stage where you wear your costumes for the first time the anti prova generale that you really try to sing the whole thing possibly with no interruptions throughout wearing costumes for the first time then wearing costumes for the first time which is disastrous uh, usually normally I had another method though that if they could prepare them for me sooner I always wore them a bit before and I asked if it were possible during certain rehearsals to get used to them if it was a difficult costume to get used to so at this stage again which probably is about 18 to 20 days by now you are at the shall we say five days before the performance they give the anteprova generale and it's the first dress rehearsal first dress rehearsal then you have your dress rehearsal, the full dress rehearsal. There's no stopping unless it's something terribly good, just like a performance with the critics. 
So you sing throughout with no interruption as it was a performance. Then they give you normally not more, not less than two days, not more than three days before a performance. One day you are uh, frankly, uh, practically sick, you're so tired. The second day you rewind and the third day you're ready to go. Uh, then, after the first performance, real good solid work starts mm -hmm. because then you fill in the blank points. You have made a pract uh, practically a, a rough uh, sketching because it can never be the real sketch unless you have had so much time. But there's nothing like stage performances that can fill in the little... Stage performances in front of an audience. In front of an audience yes. that you test yourself, your colleagues, the orchestra. It's uh, the, the intangible things that uh, are so beautiful about music. You talked about studying, working on the individual character, the person that you're going to sing and represent on the stage. When you start work on that, when you actually tackle it, do you do it mostly from the score, from the notes, or from the libretto, or from... Uh, what uh, approach to the character? The libretto, you? with the... For instance, let us, uh, let us talk about Anna Bolena. Yes. Which is something... Uh, Anne Boleyn, yes. Anne Boleyn is by Donizetti, as you well know, and history has his story of Anne Boleyn. Yes. Which is quite different from the Donizetti Anne Boleyn. Zetti has made her a, uh, a sublime woman, a victim, uh, a victim of circumstances and uh, nearly a heroine. Yes, it's a romantic so view of history, maybe. Exactly. So I couldn't bother with history after no. a while because it, it, it really <laughs> completely uh, ruined my insight of it. So I had to really go by the music and by Bellini's, uh, pardon, Donizetti's libretto. The music itself justifies it, so the main thing, I believe, is not the libretto, is mainly, though I give enormous attention to the words, I try to find truth in the music. Then you work the role as years go by, if you care to really work hard. So eventually, uh, with the years, you even can change hairdos, you can change com costumes. My Traviata has changed frequently. My uh, Norma, more or less, not much. It has, but not that much, because uh, Norma doesn't stand that much. Medea has changed, definitely, yes, a lot. Because I've seen her, a very static figure, a very uh, barbaric creature that uh, knows what she wants from the beginning. And as I grew, I learned to know that uh, Medea, though she was uh, very nasty character. After all, though, Jasone uh, was even worse than she was. She was right in... And she was right. At least in her I mean, motives. In her motives. Yes. Not in all so directions. So I thought later on that if I created a softer hairdo and a softer appearance, that I might really create her as a more of a, a woman, a living woman. If you don't persuade the public that you believe in the role and whatever gesture you do is true, 
Maybe you're not right. But so long as you persuade the public that it's so, As the opera goes on, the less she moved, logically also, her kind of sickness would not permit much movement also. So towards the third and fourth act, the less she moved, the more the music gained and the more the uh, role gained. Also, the public, I can afford little movement. Certainly. And towards the last act, I had preferred also a uh, sort of a useless movement, uh, like a trying to fetch something, whatever it was, a useless gesture like trying to get the mirror or something on the dressing table and not being able to and always just dropping the hand because uh, you couldn't quite manage it. Like the breathing should have been shorter, it should have been more... The coloring of the voice should have been a little more tired. In fact, I had, uh, without the critics knowing it, I had a compliment paid to me by saying that the coloring of my voice in other words, they wouldn't know how, but the, uh, the critics said that Kalas in Traviata appeared to us tired. In the last act? Generally. Generally, yes. Yes, and especially in the last act. This was a, a compliment for me because I struggled so hard to find this particular quiet, uh, rather little tired quality that I wanted and took a long time to have it. And it's dangerous, uh, dangerous yes. work also because you... So it's like on a, a little thread that can break from one minute to the other, the sound you want. Some detail, something that I uh, wish to say that I will never forget, but uh, Seraphine told me about Isolde when he uh, insisted upon my having some wonderful costumes made, and I promise you I didn't have the money to make them then. He says, you must have beautiful costumes, and especially in these operas that are static. I said, uh, yes, but why that? Uh, why do you insist? And he says, I'll tell you why. For an hour and ten minutes, the public has nothing to do but look at you. If you don't really fascinate them with your voice, and no matter how much you fascinate them with your voice and your role, they still have all the time, which means an hour and ten minutes, to cut you to pieces. Take your costume and cut it to pieces. So if you don't really give it the best, you're in for disaster. So uh, at least the... Uh, the vision of what the, they get should be harmonious, should be nice, like the music that you give them. When music fails to agree to the ear, in other words, to soothe the ear and the heart and the senses, then it has missed its point. That's why I don't agree with modern music. Because whatever bothers the nervous system, especially music that should, was, and is, I'm sure, created for soothing purposes, you've missed your point. Music should be essentially simple, and upon simplicity and beauty of line, it can become great. I think that it's very difficult to top a Verdi, a yes. Bellini, a Rossini, a Donizetti, though uh, intellectuals can say, oh, but they're so old-fashioned. There's nothing old-fashioned other than performers. You've said before now that you thought of opera as being in some way a, a, a dead Form. Did, were you really thinking of the whole operatic art, so to speak, or the operas written a hundred years and more ago, the sort of operas that you've mostly sung? Uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid it's true that I think it's dead in this sense, that uh, you can't very well imagine today of today singing I love you and singing I hate you or whatever feeling. It can be spoken mm. and it can be screamed, but it's out of style to sing it frankly. Well, it's a convention, of course. You sing it? of happiness, but you just sing mm. no words, probably. Yes. And that's what I mean uh, also because it was quite old-fashioned, I feel. And we haven't done much to modernize it, also. Our attitude is quite old-fashioned, 
though we cannot modernize opera too much because as it is we must accept it it is old-fashioned we must give it a bit of uh, fresh air uh, cut certain uh, lengthy music uh, repetitions uh, try to bring our movements down to the least possible the most credible uh, to the audience to create an atmosphere that uh, we can really take them over make it as credible as uh, we can well uh, I think I said before, and I repeat again, that the first duty of a, of a singer, of, of a musician, is to create what, or rather to try to feel what the composer wanted. I have two minds. One, the mind that creates, that uh, has to do what she's supposed to, or what it's supposed to, and then I try to detach myself to become the, audi the audience, or somebody that looks mm -hmm. upon this other person. Creating. The performer's mind and a and it happens mind, all along. Think. It goes along hand in hand. The person, the the creator, shall we say, or rather the performer, because we are not creators. We are performers. Mm. We try to be faithful, and where we think that the composer may have failed, well, then we can give it a bit of fresh air, a mm -hmm. bit of life, which is what I mean by uh, opera being dead. So we give it a breath of life even if the composer maybe didn't uh, feel it then, because as life goes on, time has changed. Has changed. Mo uh, life has become more modern. A hundred years ago, things yes, were, even jokes true. were more easy. Today, people are more serious. You can't mm. fool them that much. You talked about cutting out, or cutting, doing without yes. long stretches that were, oh, that yes. we thought were boring. Do you believe in that? I believe absolutely in that. I believe in repetition of a melody is usually never good. The sooner you come to the point, in other words, the better yes. it is, if you have any point to come to. And you must always, in other words, you begin, uh, even a, sp a phrase, when you speak, once you start, there will be, of course, a, a legato, even in speaking, then the phrase will end, you will breathe. This is a continuous movement of breathing also, and of, uh, of uh, singing. What do we do? We sing, we speak in, on music form. This is opera. The first time is the only time, never risk a second time. So mainly music also must be uh, an instrument of theater. at the end. Surely you did on and Junji twice, didn't that you? That is different. That's a, a showpiece. That quite is quite, a quite different. And then it's, a, it's yes. an ex... Yes. There exactly is what I say. It's a, and a, a complete expression of happiness, yes. of joy. Yes. There, vocalizing is justified. Yes. Because the whole piece is a little uh, naive, shall yes. we say. Not all music is really delicious of every composer. There are certain ev uh, points certain uh, mm. parts of the opera, even in Verdi, who was much later than Donizetti and Rossini, that today are tiresome. To you speak. always have to be the performer in function of the composer that the public will listen to. And you must make it a success. Yes. So this changes because a hundred years ago the public was different, they used to dress different, they used to think differently. Now dress, the public dresses differently, thinks differently, and uh, we must act accordingly, though keeping always the atmosphere and the, uh, the poetry, the mysticism, the what makes theatre work. This is what we learn from old people, what I yeah. learned from old Serafin, to always prepare a phrase, to always dig deeper into the what the composer wanted and uh, how he felt and uh, how he used to struggle on one phrase to, to, to show uh, the horror or the love or the poetry of, all this atmosphere. But now that's real, that's not old so that fashioned, is that's not uh, real. Well, feeling is real. Feeling is real. Feeling was always yeah. real. And I feel that deep feeling, honest feeling, is and always will be. Mm -hmm. 